Out of all three ancient weapons that exist in the One Piece world, I think it's fair to say that Uranus has been the one that Oda has kept under wraps the most. It's only been mentioned by name one time in the story so far, which is nothing compared to Poseidon, who we've already met, and Pluton, whose location has already been discovered by the Straw Hats. I mean, why is Oda keeping his cards so close to his chest with this one in particular? It took us until chapter 1073 to learn a single Gorosei member's name, and he just so happens to be named Saturn, which is the adjacent planet to Uranus in our own solar system. And he is one of the highest ranking members of the Celestial Dragons, which is a name I think we've taken for granted up until now, and we've actually met several races that were originally from outer space, and since those people now live in the sky, I think we can start piecing together what Uranus actually is. But I think the first step is to kind of break down each of the other ancient weapons to give us a frame of reference for Uranus, such as how each of them represent different gods from Greek mythology. Poseidon was the god of the sea, which ended up being pretty appropriate for Shirahoshi, who can control the sea kings, and Pluton is the god of the underworld, which also seems kind of appropriate since it's deep beneath Wano right now. And then Uranus was the god of the sky, which sets up the ancient weapons to potentially be masters of their own domains in a way. Furthermore, or if we use Poseidon as an example, they all may have had more than one component to them. Shirahoshi is technically Poseidon, but her power is really driven by the fact that she can command the powerful Sea Kings. And they're also supposed to work together to ultimately pull the fishmen to the surface on the Noah at some point in the future. Now while Oda may not stick to this exact template for every ancient weapon, it at least gives us a rough idea as we consider the other two. For Pluton, we've already heard that it's a type of ship, which kind of parallels the Noah right away. But if you followed the channel at all or even heard my introduction on the Reverie, then you would know that I think Pluton is a bit more complicated than that. I mean, Tsukiyaki did say it was sleeping beneath the castle, which doesn't sound like the word you would use for an inanimate ship, and could hint that Pluton and maybe just all of the ancient weapons are based on living things. But of course, we need to move on to Uranus, so I'll just throw my Pluton theory in the description for now, because what's important to take away here is that other than being able to destroy the world, of course, both Poseidon and Pluton seem to share one key characteristic, and that's providing some type of transportation. The Noah is meant to be pulled by the Sea Kings to get the fishmen to the surface at some point in the future, and Pluton itself has been called a ship, which is the quintessential way of traveling in the One Piece world. So I thought to myself, have we seen anything in the story that transports people through the sky? And I would argue that we've seen quite a few. The Ark Maxim is one of the first things that comes to mind, but there were also also creatures native to Skypea that helped the crew travel up and down while we were there. I mean, when we first got there, Zoro sliced a fish that popped like a balloon, which was a hint right away that things were different up here. And when we got to Heaven's Gate, which by the way, Uranus is also the god of the heavens, the express lobster is what took them up to Skypea. And after the arc was over, an octopus balloon took them back down to the Blue Sea. So this shows us that Sky Island creatures have a knack for helping people travel through the sky. So I think Think whatever Uranus is, it's probably better at it than anybody. But even Momonosuke and Kaido are good examples, who are both dragons capable of transporting people through the air thanks to the use of their flame clouds. We saw Momonosuke fly Luffy back up to Onigashima to fight Kaido again, and Kaido actually used his flame clouds to transport the entirety of Onigashima in the first place. And then that led me to another thought. Aren't flame clouds very similar to the clouds that make up sky islands? They both somehow suspend massive weight in mid-air, unlike normal clouds are able to do, and Kaido's flame clouds moving Onigashima through the sky is pretty similar to the white sky island clouds carrying the Verth that was Shandora. So I wonder if there's some type of parallel since Shandora is where we first saw Luffy in the Nika pose after all, and Onigashima is where Luffy went into Gear 5th for the first time and did that pose yet again. And we learned in Skypea that white clouds are made with a substance called pyrobloin, or pyrobloin, which come from the volcanoes below. Which draws an interesting connection of flame clouds right away since fire or magma seem to be involved in those as well. And since dragons can breathe fire or even coat themselves in magma as we saw with Kaido, perhaps these clouds are very close to being the same thing because dragons can just supply their own pyrobloin like volcanoes do to sky islands. But I would just suspect that flame clouds are maybe more susceptible to being put out with water or something like we saw with Rizo, as where white clouds might 
might be a little more reliable. But how does this all tie back into Uranus? I mean, am I saying that Uranus is some big cloud or maybe just Kaido or Momonosuke since they can create similar clouds and transport people through the sky with them? Not exactly, but we're definitely getting there because One Piece actually has a lot of blue sea snake-like things that are tied to the sky. I mean, Kaido's fruit is technically a fish fish fruit, yet he can fly with flame clouds, and Momo might look pink, but it's the only thing Vegapunk got wrong when copying Kaido's blue dragon fruit. I mean, maybe it can't awaken, but we haven't seen that yet, but everything else is the same at least. And then in Shandora, which was sent to the sky 400 years ago, they worshipped a blue sea snake as a sun god of all things. And there's even this thing living on the moon where the Shandians are from in the first place. And yes, this thing is canon and we'll get back to him at some point. But the fact they are all tied to the sky in some way, or even live there, is really important because of where the other two ancient weapons have been located. Poseidon was found at the bottom of the ocean, which is fitting for the god of the sea, and Pluton, the god of the underworld, is deep beneath Wano's castle. So I don't think it's much of a stretch to think that Uranus would be found in the sky as well. Which takes us to none other than Skypea, and more specifically Shandora, because of the Shandians' belief in their sun god and their origins on the moon. As we saw in Anel's cover story, the Shandians, Skypeans, and Birkins all lived on the moon until at least 1100 years ago when they all had to come to Earth because of resources and each of them went on to have close ties to at least some type of god. The Skypeans called their leader god, like Gonfall, and then Enel was a Birkin who called himself a god. And then most importantly, the Shandians somehow went on to worship a blue sea snake as a sun god of all things. And yes, it is likely a sea serpent of some kind because we saw it rise out of the water back in Nolan's flashback. Which is an interesting tie to Kaido because like I said, he actually has a fish fish fruit. It's just a model of an Azure Dragon. And I know that Skypea has gotten a lot more focus lately since the reveal of Gear 5th and Sun God Nika, but I still think we've kind of taken for granted the fact that the Shandias needed some type of reason to call this serpent a Sun God specifically. I mean, obviously Nolan did the right thing by ending their ceremony and killing their god, but what could have happened long ago that led the Shandians to believe a snake like that is a god in the first place? So what happened that made this line of snakes so important to the Shandians, who were originally from the moon, but also allies to the ancient kingdom. And wait a second, doesn't that sound kind of familiar? A race from the moon thinks that a blue sea serpent thing was the sun god? Maybe like when King, a Lunarian, whose race's name alone implies that they're from the moon, believe that Kaido, who has the powers of a blue sea serpent thing technically, was Joy Boy, who we know used the same sun god powers as Luffy. That's very similar to the Shandians, who are also from the moon, worshipping a a blue sea snake thing as a sun god, who obviously ties right back into Joy Boy and Nika. So this builds an interesting connection between not only Kaido and the supposed gods of Shandora, but also Joy Boy and even the moon, which had their own blue creature as I mentioned earlier. Perhaps there was an actual dragon at some point in the past, much like the one that Kaido is based on, that could be commanded like Poseidon commands the Sea Kings. And when the Sea Kings were holding the Noah, they commented how their king is always reborn as a mermaid every few hundred years, I wonder why. If Poseidon was a mermaid the first time, then they wouldn't be wondering why Shirahoshi is one now, right? So that tells me that Poseidon may not have been a mermaid or a fishman at all the first time around, but perhaps yet another dragon because their palace literally has a dragon at the top like Kaido and Momonosuke. But maybe Uranus wasn't just a way to transport through the Earth's sky, but also outer space. I mean, we did name a planet Uranus after all, and like I mentioned earlier, we just learned in chapter 1073 that one of the Gorosei members' names is Saturn, which is adjacent to Uranus in our own solar system. And right beyond that is the planet Neptune, which is the Roman name for Poseidon, and also Shirahoshi's dad. So there's probably a connection there too. And right beyond that is Pluto, which is an alternate name for Pluton. If Uranus might be a dragon of some sort, and the Sea Kings indicated that Poseidon didn't used to be part of the Merfolk, maybe they were a dragon too. And then we have a Gorosei 
member named after a planet, and they're the head of the celestial dragons. And they're collectively also called the five elder stars. There has to be some type of connection here, right? I mean, are the Gorosei basically ancient weapons themselves? And if you think about it, outer space is almost like another version of the sea, but just on a much bigger scale. And the planets are almost like individual islands. Maybe Uranus was some type of conduit to travel between them for the ancient kingdom. Almost like a space king of sorts, as opposed to normal sea kings. Or maybe another way to put it would be a literal celestial dragon. Which again, would be fitting since Saturn is one of the heads of the celestial dragons. Oda might just have literal lizard people running the world of One Piece. And if we assume that the remaining Gorosei are named after the rest of the planets in our solar system, with Emu probably being tied to Earth and Luffy tied to the Sun, then they also very conveniently match up with these five elements, which also use the same kanji as five of the days of the week, with the other two being Sunday and Monday, which appropriately tied to the sun and the moon. Maybe these elements are what their powers are all about. And maybe we're jumping the gun a little bit here, but if we look at their order the first time that we meet them, then each of the Gorosei would be associated with these planets. So then each Gorosei would also be associated with each of these elements. And that would mean that the Gandhi looking Gorosei guy is tied to gold or metal, and he just so happens to have a sword that might just be the supreme grade Shodai Kitetsu. I wonder if that sword is actually made out of pure gold, because that's really not something we've seen yet in One Piece. And again, they're all the heads of the celestial dragons. I'm just going to keep hammering this home. And Uranus has quite the potential to be a dragon, as I've laid out already, and Uranus is the god of the sky. And if the snakes of Shandora are actually descendants of the original Uranus, like Shirahoshi seems to be to the original Poseidon, then I could understand why they believed it to be a literal god. I mean, at a minimum, the three sky races needed some way to get down to Earth. And unless the moon had its own resources, they probably traveled through space gathering resources before that. Maybe the reason they had to go to Earth at all was because Uranus was going to pass away soon. And I know you guys are probably thinking at this point that Nola and its ancestors don't look that much like a dragon like Kaido. And at the very least, they definitely don't create their own sky clouds or anything like that. So how could it ever be related to Uranus? Well, first of all, don't ever judge a book by its cover when it comes to the ancient weapons. Shirahoshi is absolutely massive compared to her parents, and the powers of Poseidon skipped many generations until she was born. Uranus could very well just work the same way. And like I said earlier, the Sea Kings indicated that the very first Poseidon wasn't a mermaid like Shirahoshi, which could mean that the original Uranus was nothing like the Snakes of Shandora or anything else we've seen for that matter either. But what I really think is fitting is that snakes, and even dragons in a lot of types of media, hatch from eggs. So to build off of that point, let's look at one of the few other likely references to Uranus in the story. And that's back in Chapter Zero during the Ed War. Shiki told Roger that he knew Roger was aware of the location of an ancient weapon that can destroy the world. And it's important to note that Roger already had that huge egg on his ship by this point. Now on face value, Shiki could be referencing any of the three ancient weapons, but I think we can at least roll out Poseidon right away because we saw Roger learn about her while he was with Odin, which was after this event. And we can almost rule out Pluton, I think, because we know that its location is revealed by the Poneglyph in Alabasta, which he did not visit with Odin. Now, maybe Roger somehow learned that information elsewhere, like from someone else that already knew it, but Roger never even stepped foot in Wano. So for him to somehow learn where an ancient weapon was, but never even think about going there, or even mentioning to Odin, like, hey, there's an ancient weapon under your country, that would be pretty weird to me. So I don't think that Pluton is the one that Shiki was talking about. So that leads me to think that Shiki was likely referring to Uranus. Although we don't know where the Poneglyph is that tells us its location or anything, and like many theorists have guessed so far, I think Uranus was ironically in the egg that was on Roger's ship right in front of Shiki, and potentially even contributed to the crazy storm that happened during their battle, because we really don't know how it ended other than that Roger won somehow. But how did Roger learn of Uranus's location and find the egg in the first place if he had it before he even met Odin? The whole reason he asked Whitebeard to have Odin join his crew was because he was unable to read the Poneglyphs. So someone else who could read them must have shared that information with him. Someone that wasn't on his crew. But if Shandora and Alabaster are any indication, it's not so easy to getting access to Poneglyphs that share information about the ancient weapons. I mean, Shandora went to war to protect their Poneglyph 800 years ago, and Alabasta may have been protecting theirs for 4,000 years because that's how old Alubarna is. So what individual from Roger's era, from before the 
the Ed War would not only have the potential to read Poneglyphs, but get access to what is likely a heavily guarded Poneglyph, and also reveal it to Roger somehow. Well, one possibility is just the royalty of whatever kingdom holds the Poneglyph of Uranus. I mean, Neptune and Sukiyaki knew a lot about their history and the secrets that they were guarding, so if Roger had saved an important country like Luffy has done oh so many times, then their royalty sharing that information with him is a possibility. But I think that's almost too simple. Roger's had so many crazy adventures during his day, and there's actually one very important one that we know happened before the Ed War, and that would be God Valley. So I think the person who actually told Roger was none other than Rox D. Zebek. But before I even build off of that idea, we should consider that the ancient weapon Poneglyphs have already built somewhat of a pattern. Poseidon, the god of the sea, had their location revealed by a Poneglyph in the sky. Then Pluton, the god of the underworld, had their Poneglyph underground. So if this trend continues, then I think we can expect to find the Poneglyph for the god of the sky underwater at some point. And I think God Valley might make sense because Sengoku already told us that God Valley has been erased off the map, which could mean anything from it being destroyed like Lelucia by an emu blast, it being sent to the sky like Shandora, or even potentially sent to the bottom of the sea. And this would be a nice inversion of what happened to Shandora. I mean, if there's a way to send islands to the sky of all places, I would have to imagine that there's a mechanism to do the reverse. I mean, it's One Piece we're talking about after all. I think this would be a really nice twist because many of us, including myself, have been expecting God Valley to be deleted like Lelucia was, but we really haven't seen an island get erased by sinking into the sea yet, which is odd for a story based on pirates, unless you count the old country of Wano, which is submerged by their own freshwater. But there still is a Wano in the same place on the map, so it's definitely not the same situation. So maybe God Valley was actually sent under the sea. Maybe instead of a knock upstream, there was something that pulled the island downward. A knock downstream, if you will. I mean, the only the only other example that I can think of where we see an island getting submerged like that is the ancient city underneath Water 7, which we haven't even actually seen yet. But it's also a potential option for this Poneglyph's location, I think. We know that the old shipwrights of Water 7 built Pluton long ago, so I imagine they were allied with the ancient kingdom, so it's entirely possible that they would have a Poneglyph. Not to mention that Roger visited Water 7 while he was rounding up all the load Poneglyphs with Odin on his way to Laugh Tale, and I can't imagine Imagine he just stopped there just to say hello to everyone unless something important was there. I mean, every other place they stopped at had a Poneglyph other than Water 7. So I think Oda just chose not to show it to us because it would probably spoil something. But I actually think there's a chance Oda has already shown us the Poneglyph that we're talking about. Because a certain Straw Hat did find one underwater in some ancient ruins. And it currently belongs to Big Mom and the Straw Hats actually have a copy of it. And that would be the Poneglyph that Jin Jinbei found in his cover story. Throughout his cover story series, Jinbei basically helps out some sea beasts by figuring out that Wadatsumi had been removing the underwater ruins that they all use as their home, and the ruins landed on a nearby island which caused its own problems. But at the very end, it's revealed that these ruins held a Poneglyph inside. Now on face value, it might be a stretch to think that this Poneglyph is the one that would hold the information about Uranus, but there are some important things to note. First off is like I said, the Straw Hats already have a copy of this Poneglyph because we all remember when Brooke went in and got the copy of the load Poneglyph but Big Mom also had several next to it and Brooke came out with several different rubbings. So one of those is likely the same Poneglyph that Jinbei brought her during his cover story. And since we've already had it for a while, that probably means that Robin has likely read it already, which fits perfectly into the trend that we already have where Robin didn't tell us that she knew about Poseidon until we got to Fishman Island and she didn't tell us that she knew about Pluto on until we got to Wano. Robin has a knack for hiding key information that she already knows until the right time. So if this Poneglyph really had information about Uranus, it would be a perfect roundabout way for Robin to have read a Poneglyph that was found underwater without us actually having to go there. Which matches the other trend I mentioned earlier where Poseidon's Poneglyph was in the sky, so Uranus's should be under the sea. Not to mention, we found a lot of Poneglyphs already in the story. There are 30 in total and the wiki shows we found about half of them. And this is technically the third one that we've already seen under the sea at least at some point in time because in Roger's flashback we saw two down in Fishman Island. Given that all the Poneglyphs were meant to be guarded by different allied kingdoms, how many more can we realistically expect to be underwater at this point? I mean, ironically, this one was being guarded by sea beasts, while the one in 
Pandora was being guarded by a sea snake. So I really do like the chances of this Poneglyph being the one that talks about Uranus. And since there was a Poneglyph here, that would mean that these ruins originally belonged to some nation that was allied with the Ancient Kingdom. But apparently they fell at some point. And I think there's a decent chance that these ruins were originally found at God Valley. Jinbei started this cover story right outside of the G5 base, which is near the Red Line in the New World. And we know that the Celestial Dragons were also at God Valley. So the fact that these ruins are so close to the Red Line, and thus Marijua, is a strong start, I think. And if this is the Poneglyph with Uranus's location, then maybe the name God Valley means more than we thought, since Uranus is named after the God of the Sky after all. And the word Valley itself indicates a low-lying area, maybe so low that it got submerged. I don't think Oda would show us this cover story with a future straw hat of all things if it wasn't going to be important. I mean, my Pluton theory originated from Gadatsu's cover story of all things, so I think every cover story deserves a second look. Like, is Caribou a clone of this guy or something? But I also would like to take a quick second to thank some of my members, being 3Day, Sitorius, and Matt Cypher for helping me with parts of this theory, as well as Itachi, Partha, and the rest of my members for supporting the channel. And I'm actually dropping some members-only content soon, so click join down below if you're interested. But I think there are also a lot of other potentially interesting ties between God Valley and the ancient weapon Uranus. We don't really know all that much about God Valley yet, although we'll take that information whenever you're ready, Oda. We do know that this incident is where Kaido got his devil fruit, and I've already drawn so many potential connections between Kaido and a potential Uranus already. Plus, we saw Kaido apparently left that incident early because of Big Mom's reaction afterward, where she was asking where he went. Could it be that Rock said something that motivated him, or maybe even upset him so much that he had to take off right away? I mean, almost every time a big time character has died in One Piece, their final words carry a ton of weight. I mean, Roger started the Great Pirate Era, Whitebeard said the One Piece is real and started a meme, and Odin claimed that someone was coming to save Wano in the future, and that Odin was born to boil. So I can only imagine that someone with the stature of Zebek had some famous final words as well. And what if they were about the location of Uranus, a weapon that has the power to destroy the world? I mean, if Rox read the Poneglyph for Uranus, it would only tell him the location, and not the powers or what it looks like or anything like that. And we know that because of the Poneglyph in Chandora, which only told Odin where Poseidon would be found and not that it would be a mermaid or anything like that. That could explain why Kaido took off right away, and maybe even why he got that fruit from Big Mom in the first place. Maybe he wanted to take off for the sky as quick as possible and search for that ancient weapon. And Kaido and Big Mom said specifically that they were going to get the ancient weapons when they teamed up in Wano. I mean, if Kaido respected Rox, which I highly suspect he did, because Kaido respects strength the most, and Rox is undoubtedly one of the most top tiers of all time, maybe he wanted to do everything he could to avenge his captain, and maybe even fulfill his captain's dream. Maybe Kaido even has a small case of the Yamato Syndrome, where he was so moved by someone's death that he spent the rest of his life trying to be like them and live out their dream, as opposed to his own. And I think that would be really fitting, especially if Yamato ends up realizing that she shouldn't be like Odin, but be better than him, or something like that at least. But either way, if Uranus really is in that egg, then I can absolutely see why Roger kept it with him during his journey. I mean, if a bunch of strong pirates like the Rocks Pirates knew of its original whereabouts, it's probably a lot safer to keep with Roger, since his crew is the strongest in all of the seas, and it would also remove the burden from the people that lived wherever the egg was found. Which, if you haven't pieced it together by now, I think that egg was definitely found in Chandora. Because that egg is probably from Nola, meaning that the first offspring from this lineage that was born after it was sent to the sky is Uranus, which would just be poetic if you ask me. And I think there's actually evidence for this too, and that's because of how nonchalantly Roger and Odin got to the Poneglyph when they visited Skypea. I mean, there was no fanfare at all. It was all business. We didn't see him greet everyone like we saw in Water 7, Zoe, or Fishman Island. It was literally a page and a half from the start of the knockup stream to Odin finishing up the carving of Roger's message. And based off what we've learned about the Shandians, do you think for a single second that they'd let just anyone walk in and access that Poneglyph? I mean, they 
they fought a war 800 years ago to protect that thing, and they haven't been particularly cheerful to visitors lately. That tells me that Roger had to have met them at some point in the past and built a very positive relationship with them, much like Noland and Luffy did. So I'm guessing Roger had visited there at some point before and befriended them, and maybe it was because he took Nola's egg for safekeeping. I mean, it feels to me like Oda really went out of his way to keep this guy Pia flashback short and sweet, and maybe that's because there's a lot to hide here. Maybe after God Valley, several rocks pirates raced to Skypea to try and find the ancient weapon, but Roger protected them and took the egg to reduce the threat that they faced. I mean, if this is all true, wouldn't that also put our introduction to Kaido into new perspective? We've always wondered why he's so depressed and trying to find ways to die. And the very first time we saw him, he jumped from Balloon Terminal, which is a sky island. What if he had just given up looking in the sky for this ancient weapon, meaning his dreams were basically crushed, and so thus he just jumped off the island in defeat. I mean, Yerouge was up there with him, who is also a Birkin, but also a monk. So maybe he was there helping Kaido look around Sky Islands in a peaceful manner to show him that there is no ancient weapon. Kaido probably felt completely defeated after not being able to find it. Maybe because he feels like he failed his captain. Or maybe he believed all the history that they discovered together was a lie. Maybe he already knew about the prophecy of Joy Boy coming in the future, but he just no longer believed it because of this experience. If Uranus isn't where the Poneglyph said it would be, why would Joy Boy be real and why would he show up when they said that he would? Maybe that's why he laughed when King thought that he could be Joy Boy. Maybe Kaido thought the existence of Joy Boy was just as likely as Nolan thought the existence of a sun god was. When he said, only Joy Boy can beat me, maybe that's a backhanded joke to say like, yeah, I'll lose when God himself comes down to fight me. Or like in other words, yeah, I'll lose when pigs fly. Kaido was also called the strongest on land, sea, and air. And we know the ancient weapons are the gods of the underworld, sea, and the sky, which match up pretty well. And so since Joy Boy is meant to lead those three ancient weapons, could this also be a reason why King thought Kaido was actually Joy Boy? And let's also consider the fact that Kaido never awakened his mythical dragon fruit. And I've spent most of this video talking about how important all these dragons could be. So Oda is probably hiding that from us for a reason. And for the record, I know that some believe he did awaken, but until Oda confirms that like he has for the other awakenings, I'm going to assume that he didn't. But we did see that he covered himself in magic toward the end before he lost to Luffy. So I thought to myself, what's the next step above that? Something that would be fitting of the sun god that King thought he was. So what if Kaido's awakening basically lets him use the powers of the sun like he did fire and magma, like literal star power? Basically, what if it lets him become a literal celestial dragon? In some ways, he would be a sun god as well. But not the real one, of course, which is weird since he would literally have powers of the sun. And if Kaido does come back, which I definitely think he will, this would would be a pretty decent way to pull it off, I think. And while I wasn't a huge fan of how Kaido's flashback was kind of skimmed over in Wano, I do think that this type of backstory would be fitting for a character like him who obviously ended up losing to Joy Boy anyways. I mean, imagine if he originally wanted to change the world for good, but after having a reason to doubt the history that he learned with Rox, he wanted to start the world's biggest war because he didn't think the prophesized one was gonna happen. Maybe it wasn't that he was just straight up evil, but he knew a war was supposed to happen, and he decided to make sure it happened because he thought the history was already wrong. But I want to get back to Uranus, so I'll save the rest of the Kaido and Rocks discussion for another video that's coming soon, so make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. So let's now talk about the powers, design, and whatever else that is specific to Uranus. And I suspect it's basically going to be a bigger version of Kaido's dragon form. And I say that because Nola was already huge after it grew up, but Roger's egg was many times the size of young Nola. But I also imagine that Uranus looks much derpier because this is Oda we're talking about. And I think he's also going to find some way to make every ancient weapon look very unexpected. I mean, if you've seen my Pluton theory, then you already know there's some potential with that one. And Poseidon was a mermaid, which Odin didn't even see coming despite reading the Poneglyph for it. And I wouldn't be surprised if Uranus looked a lot like this thing that we saw in space. I mean, I'm not really sure what this thing is, but it was found helping the space pirates during Enel's cover story. And it just looks so happy for some reason. But don't let that distract you from the fact that it's a sentient space creature that can apparently build things on the moon. And that's not the only space creature we've heard of. 
Like what about the one in Vegapunk's lab that Kaku and Luffy ran into? It's almost like a twisted version of the banana dials that we saw in Alabasta. So maybe space creatures are just different evolutions of creatures that we find on the One Piece Earth. And if we go back to our friends on the moon, the markings on his stomach almost make me think it could be a space whale of some sort. Except it's all stretched out. Which I'd be a fool not to at least mention the possibility that this has something to do with the awakening of the Nika fruit. Or maybe it paid a visit to my boys at Long Ring Longland. I mean, we know whales can have islands inside of them that people can stay inside of, so what if Uranus was just a stretched out space whale type thing for people to ride in and travel through space? And that's where Nola's ability comes in that is often forgotten, which is how observation hockey, or mantra, wouldn't work through it. And Nell couldn't detect Luffy while he was stuck inside of Nola, and Isa couldn't detect anyone outside of it while she was stuck inside. Why would a living creature have this ability? Especially one that I've already mentioned could be tied to space travel in some way. It's almost like it's the perfect vehicle for espionage so you could travel undetected. And maybe its descendant, Uranus, can do the same. And that actually builds an interesting parallel to Luffy in Fishman Island, who hid inside of Ho the Whale until the perfect time to save them from Hody. So there's just all sorts of connections here, I think. I mean, what if Uranus was used as some type of Trojan horse for the Ancient Kingdom? Or even for the Celestial Dragons, because, you know, Uranus kind of is a Celestial Dragon if it really is a sea snake-like creature that travels in space. And that's kind of interesting because the Greek god Uranus is a bit different than Pluton and Poseidon. Uranus actually fathered the 12 Titans with his wife Gaia, who represents the Earth. And long story short, Uranus is basically Pluton and Poseidon's grandpa in Greek mythology. And Uranus is actually the god of the sky and the heavens, which also could indicate a bigger tie into space and maybe even the first arrival of several races to the Earth. So while I expect Uranus to be a bit silly because it's Oda's story, I also expect it to have some insane powers. Just like a mermaid that can control massive sea monsters, and a ship that can apparently destroy the world, I expect Uranus to be worthy of the name of an ancient weapon. And of course, the first step to that is simply the ability to fly. And I would suspect that it uses some kind of clouds to fly just like dragons do, but maybe they use sky clouds instead of flame clouds. And whenever it travels in space, I think it uses a different mechanism, and that would be wings. The first reason I say that is because all of the moon races have wings themselves. The Shandians, Skypeans, and Birkins all have them, even if they don't actually work on Earth. And then King also has wings, but his actually do work on Earth. And I think the reason that the first three races have wings that don't work on Earth is because they probably worked a lot better better when they lived on the moon, where they originated and there's less gravity. So I bet they had no problem flying back in the day, but because of the increased gravity on Earth, they probably couldn't use them anymore. Which then raises the question of why King can fly on Earth, despite his race seemingly coming from the moon as well. And also, why can King's race survive in such harsh environments? Well maybe that's because they aren't from the same moon as these other races in the first place. But anyway, as it pertains to Uranus, it having wings to fly in space makes a lot of sense. Shirahoshi was the the fastest swimmer in Fishman Island, so I can only imagine that Uranus is going to be an absolute speedster in space as well. Since like I said, space is almost like a bigger version of the sea, and having wings ties it to another popular creature that people often bring up in Uranus theories, and that is Quetzalcoatl. And if you haven't heard of it before, I'll just give you the very quick cliff notes. Quetzalcoatl is a feathered serpent deity that also comes with wings, and it's from ancient Mesoamerican culture which honestly has a lot of parallels to the Shandians, and many descriptions of this deity say that it breathed life into man, or at least those in their society. So in a sense, they all owe their existence to this deity. And that builds a really interesting connection to what I said earlier about the Greek god Uranus being the father of the Titans, as well as how strongly the Shandians believed in their god. And to build onto this even more, take a look at this panel from the Alabasta Crypt that dates back almost 4,000 years ago. I've already discussed in other videos about how Poseidon and Pluton might be illustrated on these sides of the room, but what's important is what's up here in the middle. I mean, what does that look like to you? Because to me, it looks like what you'd see if you looked at Kaido or Momonosuke or Nola head on. It's a circle to represent their tubular body, basically, but it also has the iconic mustache. And underneath, there are these three symbols which I think signify flame clouds. And this symbol is in the dead center right between two guardian deities of Alabasta. And the fruits for these deities belong to the top two members of the Alabasta army. So for this symbol to be in the middle means it must be extremely important. 
important. I mean, what if Uranus was basically the guardian deity of Earth at some point? And I think there's a lot to say about that, but this video is already getting pretty long, so I'm just gonna save it for my future Ancient Weapon Origins video that's coming out in about a month or so. But we also need to ask ourselves where Uranus is at right now. If it really is in that egg, then it didn't hatch last time we saw it, but that was over 20 years ago. So where could it possibly be now? Well, it might be a basic answer, but I think it's with Scopper Gabon, and it probably hatched around the same time that Shirahoshi was born so that their connection gets even deeper. This would also give more reason to Roger's line about being too early. Maybe Poseidon wasn't born yet, Uranus hadn't hatched yet, and Joy Boy wasn't around yet. They probably all need to work together to accomplish whatever big event is going to occur in the final saga, and the reason I say Scopper Gabon of all people is the one with Uranus is because if Roger decided to take that egg with him during his whole journey all the way to the very end, then I doubt he just dropped it off just anywhere before he died, or just let any bozo guard it in his stead, especially since it was going to hatch at some point, I would assume. So much like Rayleigh stayed at Saba Odi and had a role to play by getting pirates to the New World, I think Scopper has been with Uranus since the Roger pirates disbanded. And that leads me to another point. Who possibly controls this creature? I mean, if Shirahoshi controls the Sea Kings, then surely Uranus is going to have someone leading it as well, right? Well, to keep this part as short as possible, I think it's going to be Isa from Skypiea. She had a crazy mantra for some reason, which may be a precursor to the voice of all things, and she was born on a sky island, which fits right in with Uranus. But I do think there's a good chance for Vivi as well. I personally have her penciled in for Pluton, because she was born where the Pluton Poneglyph was found after all. But of course, Vivi also made it rain at the end of the Alabasta arc, which was like a miracle at the time. So whoever it is, I think it's going to be one of these two that control Uranus. But let's wrap this up with the rest of the powers that Uranus will possess. Because for it to be capable of destroying the world, it's gotta pack a punch. And maybe some of you are jumping right to Emu's Blast in Chapter 1060. But for many reasons that I've laid out in other videos, I think that attack was something tied to Emu's power specifically and not the current ancient weapon Uranus. I mean, maybe Emu is a past version of Uranus, which would be an amazing twist, especially if God Valley actually did end up having a connection to Uranus, as I predicted, since the Celestial Dragons were there. But I think the most important power that Uranus will possess is the ability to control the weather. And the way it will do that is the exact same way that Nami does, which is with clouds. Which is fitting since Nami also used weather eggs, and that's where Uranus is hatching from. I mean, Kaido was able to control the weather a decent amount himself, either by pulling in clouds to block the moon, or creating crazy winds, or what have you. So just imagine that, but on a whole new level, where they can even create rain, snow, lightning, hails, tornadoes, or whatever you want. Nami usually does this by creating weather balls to create hot and cold zones that create lightning strikes of different sizes. And if Uranus is going to be as massive as I expect, which would probably be even bigger than Kaido, then it probably could destroy the world. Especially if it can create winds so strong that it alters the spin of the planet, because then it would create tsunamis and eruptions and who knows what else that would surely spell the end of the planet. Kind of like Oda told us in this SBS about how important the swirls of the planet are. And I wouldn't be surprised if Uranus was also able to do a massive boro breath, which that alone could devastate the planet. But I doubt that's what the Ancient Kingdom used it for. When we were in Alabasta, the main issue was a lack of water because of the dance powder. But of course, after Luffy's battle with Crocodile ended and Vivi shouted to her people long enough, it rained. It was like salvation to their people. And I think that's what Uranus was used for long ago in the past. Instead of taking water from other countries, I bet Uranus was able to provide rain to any country that needed it. It could make it warmer if they were cold, or colder if they were warm, kind of like Vegapunk has been working on since he was a kid back in Karakuri Island. And maybe it could even make troublesome islands more habitable, like Raijin Island or even Punk Hazard today. Whatever it was, I think much like the other ancient weapons, Uranus Uranus is just a good thing that can be used in wrong ways. But if you want more information on clouds and how important they are to One Piece, I definitely recommend these videos from my friend Ayo Larry and Parvision because they covered a lot of information that I didn't manage to get to here. But as always guys, thank you so much for watching and I'll catch you next time. Later.